Well, good morning, everybody. It's a blessing to again be gathered together on the Lord's Day, and I invite you as we uh, turn to our focus and attention on the exposition of God's Word, if you turn with me in your copy of, of the Bible to the book of Galatians in the New Testament, Paul's epistle to the Galatians. We find ourselves nearing the end of this epistle, and we begin chapter 6 this morning. Our text for this morning will be, um, I think I wrote it, I realized I just wrote it wrong in your bulletin, Uh, chapter 20, uh, excuse me, verse 26 of chapter 5, reading through verse 2 of chapter 6, but let us begin by reading in verse 22 of chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Amen. May God add His blessing to the reading of His Word. If you would, please bow with me and let us seek God's help and blessing as we come to the preaching of His Word this morning. Let us pray together. Our gracious God and Father, as we've sung, even if the whole realm of nature were ours, that would be a present far too small to give to you in return for what you have done for us in your Son, that what you have done demands our life and our all. Lord, you alone are worthy of our service and our worship. You alone are worthy of our adoration, our praises, our thanksgivings, our trust, our obedience in fulfilling the law of love, the law of Christ. Lord, we pray that as we come to the breaking open of Your Word and considering uh, Your majestic instruction to us in the Scriptures, we pray, Lord, that Your Holy Spirit would be our teacher. Lord, we all confess that our, our minds by nature are shrouded in darkness. Lord, our wills by nature are bound to sin. And Lord, You have freed us through the Gospel of Your Son. You have renewed our minds. You have given us new hearts, a new desire to want to live before Your face in a way that's pleasing to You. And we pray, Father, that through these particular instructions, Lord, You would shape Your people. That we would become this kind of compassionate, loving and caring and redemptive restorers of our brother who is in error. Lord, that You would grow us in humility and gentleness. That You would grow us in self-watchfulness. That we would always remember when we see another brother erring and in sin, that You would help us to always, with a humble frame of mind, remember that next time it may very well be us who needs to be restored. Lord, we pray that we would be those who love one another in the church. That we would be those who are our brother's keeper and who care for our brother. That we would not watch them languish in sin, being ensnared, but that, Lord, we would view ourselves as their rescuer, even as the Lord Jesus has rescued us. Father, teach us, we pray. Be our help. Instruct us. Exhort us. Correct us. We ask, Lord, for any who are in our midst this morning who do not believe the Gospel, who are not reconciled to You, Father, by the blood and righteousness of Your Son, we pray that this very morning Your Spirit would move powerfully and irresistibly upon their hearts. That You would open up to them the Scriptures. That they would penetrate their hearts and bring to them a genuine conviction of sin. 
and that they would for the first time look to Christ by faith with empty hands knowing that it is only His righteousness and His blood which can save us. Father, glorify Yourself, we pray. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we continue this morning in this very practical section of the epistle in which in these next nine verses of chapter 6, Paul will in staccato fashion apply the fruit of the Spirit to these Galatians' life together in their respective churches. Uh, This is, we're getting to the section of the epistle now where this is theology applied. He is taking the lofty subjects that he has opened up in this book, like justification and sanctification, the role of the law, the role of the gospel, and he's bringing all of it down to the lowest shelf, and he's saying, Christian, this is how we now live in light of such things. The gospel has implications. The gospel has a therefore. Right? It's not just a bunch of doctrine in the head without hands and feet of holy living. That's what the Judaizers accused Paul of. You remember their accusations? Paul, Paul just preaches a gospel of lawlessness. Uh, Paul preaches a gospel that makes Christ a, a minister of sin because he doesn't preach the law. But nothing can be further from the truth. Christians are not lawless. Christians are not uh, easy believism, cheap grace type people that reason in this way. Well, I'm saved by grace and so now I get to live however I please. No, that's not true of a Christian. Why? Because as Paul has labored in this epistle, every person who receives a new record in heaven, our justification, by believing in Christ, by His blood and righteousness being imputed to me, All who have experienced that also have received a new heart on earth by Christ dwelling in us by His Holy Spirit. Both of those things are true of every Christian. The Christian is not only forgiven, but because of grace, he is also free. Not free to sin, but free from the enslaving power of sin so that he is made alive to God now in a way he was never alive before, and he becomes a tree upon which the Spirit of God begins to produce His fruit. And so yes, the Christian cares about the therefore of obedience, but the way the Christian approaches obedience is worlds apart from the way the Judaizers were teaching. For the Christian, grace is the key to obedience. Contrary to the Judaizers, the Christian does, dares not come to God through the law Because he knows that the law by itself kills us. That's Paul's point in Galatians 3 and 4. The law whips us with all of its rigor and its inflexible demands. And instead, what it should do is it drives us to the one, the only one who has taken on the law and come out a victor. The Lord Jesus Christ in our place. And the Christian now knows that it is in him that I find deliverance from the curse of the law, and I find new power, power that I never had before by the blessed Spirit of Christ dwelling within me, causing me to live a life pleasing to God, thus fulfilling the law of Christ. Well, it is that fulfilling the law of Christ by the Spirit that Paul unpacks in these next verses to these Galatians who you remember had made an absolute mess of their relationships in the church. They're devouring one another because they have at least temporarily departed from the grace of the gospel. Remember, Paul says they have fallen from grace and they've gone down the path of legalism. And what we want to consider this morning is the first of these, namely, how the family of God relates to an erring family member. How does the, the one walking in the Spirit relate to a fellow brother who is in error? or in sin. Uh, Augustine said, quote, there is no surer test of the spiritual person than his treatment of another's sin. And he goes on and he says, spiritual people, as much as they can, seek to rescue and support sinners, not to punish or triumph over them. In other words, our attitude, our, our manner, our concern or lack thereof for our brother caught in trespasses reveals a lot about where we are 
spiritually. Now, generally speaking, uh, people typically default to one of two ways of looking after their, uh, looking after, uh, their neighbor. We either, typically by nature, uh, go the way of Cain, right? You remember Cain? Uh, God comes to Cain and asks him, Cain, where is your brother? And what's Cain's sarcastic response? Am I my brother's keeper, right? Uh, this is the first default. It's simply the attitude of, I, don't, I just don't care about other people. I, I don't care about the dangers of sin and the deceitfulness of sin. I don't care about the harm it causes to the reputation of Christ and the unity of the church. It's just an I, me, mine attitude and it's apathy towards everyone else. That's not spiritual. As Christians, we are our brother's keeper. But there's a second unbiblical default, and that is, that is that we keep watch over our brother like a legalist. And this person really, really wants to be their brother's keeper, but they want to be his keeper from all the wrong motivations. Right? They, they keep after their brother because they're driven by pride and envy and self-righteousness. And this person basically just becomes like a bloodhound sniffing for sin, right? trying to find sin. Because from the heart of a legalist, the more I can expose and humiliate my brother, guess what? The better I think I look, right? Uh, I mean, that means if I can expose my brother's faults, that means I get to be in the place of teacher, I get to sit in the, the holy seat and instruct the sinners. In other words, for this person, correction becomes a means of selfish self-exaltation and self-righteousness. And that's also not spiritual. That's not love. And that second default seems to be more the position that these Galatians have taken. Notice verse, I wrote verse 25. I believe it's verse 26 in your Bible. Note verse 26 of chapter 5. And, and I actually uh, personally believe Luther thought as well. Chapter 25, uh, verse 26, probably would have been better to have been kept as a unit with chapter 6. I think it's part of this, this section. But look at verse 26. Let us not become what? Con conceited, depending on your translation. Right? There's pride. Provoking one another, envying one another. Now, step back for a moment. Why do you think he says that? Well, why do you think, if you glance up at verse 15 of chapter 5, he says, he warns, but if you bite and devour one another, right, it's the imagery of dogs tearing each other to pieces, if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. What, why do you think Paul's giving these exhortations? Because that is the ugly fruit the leaven of legalism produces in a church. If you, make no mistake, if you want a divided congregation that devours itself, uh, preach legalism to them. Depart from the gospel of grace and free justification. Uh, doctrine has serious implications. Sheep tend to, to smell like what they are fed. And what comes from the pulpit is going to be reproduced in the lives of people. And these Galatians had been feasting. And you remember, Paul's astonished at how quickly they turned out of the way. They have been feasting in the dirty troughs of a doctrinal system that destroys grace, that eclipses the sufficiency of Christ to save us. And instead, it's a system that says, if you want to be made right with God, you, emphasis on you, have to perform really well. If you want to be made right with God, you've got to pass the test. And the Judaizers came to them saying things like, you know, we'll start with circumcision and the feast days and the Sabbaths, and then we'll, we'll get into the more tedious matters. But ultimately, Galatians, they were saying, your getting into the good graces of God rests in your performance to keep the law in order to merit righteousness. That's what legalism is, right? My obedience is what merits heaven and God's favor. And it damns the soul and it destroys the church. Because think about it. If that's what I believe, and these Galatians, Paul believes the best. He believes they've stumbled into error, but he believes that God will bring them back. Think about it. If that's what I believe, and that's how I'm relating to God, what will I then view my brother as? He becomes in that system a competitor with me, right? A rival. He becomes an enemy. He's actually my prey that I need to devour. 
Uh, he is grist for the, the self-righteous mill uh, to seek to make some distinction between myself, the righteous one, and these other sinners. And therefore, I rejoice in their falls, and I rub their noses in it every chance I get, and I envy their progress. Right? That's how the legalist views his brother. But how does the gospel tell me to relate to my brother? What Paul has been opening up for this entire epistle. The gospel brings us all to a level playing field, and it causes me to say to you, brother or sister, you and I both come to God with absolutely nothing in our hands except the sin which condemns us. And we cast ourselves equally as beggars before the cross of Christ and solely on the basis of God's love and God's grace to sinners, we are accepted simply through the instrument of faith in the Beloved. Not because of anything I do or bring, but solely because of Christ crucified and risen in our place. Now think about it. That has profound implications for how we then live together. That means I am no better than you, and you are no better than me. Uh, it means that Christ is all in all. That, that we're not in a competition as brothers. We are instead beggars helping other beggars on our way towards glory that has been purchased for us by sheer grace. We are brothers, as Paul's been emphasizing, brothers by the grace of adoption, who now love one another because God has loved us. And I actually, in the gospel, care for you. I want your success rather than being against you. The spiritual person rejoices in the progress of grace in their brother rather than envies it. Um, the spiritual person grieves over the falls of their brother rather than gloat over them. You see how different those are. Um, that's where Paul is beseeching these Galatians to return, is to walk in the Spirit as beggars, recipients of grace equally in Christ, and to love one another. So let's, let's dive into verses 1 and 2 here together. He says, brothers... Now, I want to encourage you, don't underestimate the importance of that little title at this point in the letter. Paul doesn't always call them brothers. We saw chapter 3, you foolish Galatians. But here, it's brothers. And there's a purpose for that. You are spiritual brothers adopted into the Father's family. Okay, now, Bethany, let that hit home. Who's the brothers? We are, right? Paul's not just talking to these Galatians. It has implications for us. We need to apply these things to ourselves as well. We are brothers, Heirs of the promise. And how do brothers relate? How do families relate to one another? Families love each other. Families care for one another. He says, brothers or brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering or looking to yourself, lest you also be tempted. I want to unpack several things here. This is where we'll spend the majority of our time the first thing, we'll just work through it, keyword by keyword. The first thing I want to unpack is this word, overtaken. Uh, the New King James has the translation, if any man is overtaken. If you have the ESV, it's translated, if anyone is caught in any, in any transgression, right? Um, that's a legitimate translation, uh, but the problem is that the English word for caught can be interpreted in a couple of different ways. And so, for instance, some have thought that what Paul is referring to here is someone who is caught by another in the act of transgression, right? Like, like if you think of the woman of John 8, right? The woman was caught in adultery, right? Red-handed. Um, kind of, you know, if, it's the idea that if our kids get out of bed late at night and they're not supposed to, and we sneak in and we flip on the light switch, we catch them, right? Um, but that's probably not the meaning of what Paul is getting at here. I think the word overtaken is helpful because it seems Paul is describing not so much a brother being caught by someone, but being caught by sin itself. In other words, sin and its deceit has ensnared this brother. Uh, Schreiner, Tom Schreiner says it denotes one who is overtaken by sin, surprise. Not, not that they're not guilty. We understand that, of course. There's always a level of culpability in our transgressions. But it's something that they were unexpectedly overpowered by. And it could be, poss it's possible that Paul is 
in particular thinking of the many of the Galatians who had been overtaken and ensnared in the Judaizers' doctrine. Uh, we, we don't know all that went on, but it's very possible that some of them were actually caught up in speaking against Paul and joining the rebellion. But be that as it may, that might be something particularly he's got on his mind. Be that as, as it may, notice how he applies it very broadly. If any man is overtaken by any trespass. In other words, all sin should concern us. All sin in our brother, any sin. It, it doesn't even need to be a trespass that was committed directly you. Right? Sometimes we think that if we see our brother sinning, but it doesn't really involve us, we just think it's kind of hands off. No. Uh, this could be things like, I mean, James, remember James, we all stumble in, in what? Many ways. Uh, could be issues of gossip or pride or fits of anger or a brother perhaps has fallen into immorality or impurity or unwholesome speech, uh, faithlessness, it could be issues in their family life that we see, issues in their, how they're operating in the workplace, uh, just their attitude. It could be doctrinal issues. He says uh, that the, these are the things that can overtake the Christian. And I think that Paul wording it this way, when he says, when he speaks of the brother being overtaken, there's a reason for that. What Paul is doing here is he's giving an incentive to those of us who will be the ones doing the restoring. It's an incentive for us to be full of pity and compassion for our brother. Not pity and compassion in the sense of going soft on truth and condoning sin, but he's reminding us here, I think, of the power and the deceit of indwelling sin to which all of us in this room are capable of being duped by. Uh, it, it steers the restorer away from a pride and self-righteous attitude and instead encourages us all to remember, but for the grace of God, there go I. Right? If it, if it isn't for the grace of God holding me, I very well next time be the one being restored. Uh, we, we've got to remember, Peter tells us, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking those whom he may devour. That, that's the devil's M.O. And he's been successful in the past. He's even got great saints like Peter, and David, and Abraham. And we need to remember, we as brothers, we all have a great real enemy who is tricky, and it is possible that real Christians get ensnared in these things. And what they need is help. So, second thing, that, that looks at this word overtake. The second thing is, who is to restore such a one? Who is to restore such a one? He says that those who are spiritual are appointed to this task. Now, think with me for a minute. How you interpret that will affect who you think this applies to. And some of you who are particularly, you know, frightened by confrontation and correction might be thinking to yourself, okay, good, Paul, Paul has given me a way out. Uh, if, I don't, if I don't want to correct someone, all I need to say is I'm not feeling spiritual right now, right? Well, good, good luck with that in terms of that sticking with the rest of the book. Some have thought that this refers to pastors. And, I mean, wouldn't that be nice, right? Let's, uh, let's let the pastors handle all the not-so-pleasant stuff. Um, others have thought that Paul's referring to the spiritually mature Christians in the congregation. And to be sure, I mean, those would be the types of people that you would seek help from if you were unable to achieve restoration by yourself. Sometimes those things are needed. But I see no reason for thinking that Paul is somehow, all of a sudden delineating some elite group here. But rather, on the contrary, take a step back, remember the whole book of Galatians. If we want to keep in thrust with uh, the entire epistle, who are the spiritual ones in Galatians? Who have, who have the spirit? Christians, right? Not, not just a portion of Christians. Uh, chapter 3, we have all received the spirit of promise and are Abraham's heirs. Uh, chapter 4, he told us that we are all children like Isaac, who was born according to the Spirit, not according to the flesh. Uh, chapter 5, he's just at length described the fruit of the Spirit. And I think it would be a really clunky transition if all of a sudden he said, but by the way, uh, some of you can't do this because you're not spiritual yet. He's not segregating the congregation. He's saying, you, all of you who are the spiritual ones, walking by the Spirit, do this. Right, I've said it before, and we all need to believe this. The only one sufficient to shepherd the congregation is the congregation. 
right? We as pastors play a, a leading role. We seek to be as faithful as we can, but uh, this is something that the whole church does to itself, right? Ephesians 4, Aaron opened up last week. Um, what, what do pastors do? They equip who? The saints for what? The work of ministry. Uh, that they might speak the, the, you know, speak the truth in love to one another so that we all grow up. Now, I think certainly you would agree that this kind of compassionate restoration would fit under that banner of speaking the truth to one another in love. Right? So that's who's appointed to do it. It's all of us. Now, the next thing, very important, what, it, what is our task? What, what does the Spirit lead us to do when one of our soldiers is down? Look at what he says. He says we are to restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Now first, I want to focus on that word restore. And I want to say two things. First, very simply, this is, you know, Sunday school type stuff. Notice it's a command. Okay, you'll see the reason I'm, I'm pointing that out. This is not optional, right? This is not Christian liberty where it's, you know, one brother thinks that that's a, a good thing to do and another just doesn't really care. No, this is a command from God. Um, and the reason I emphasize that is we can... If you think of the Christian life in the church as us driving together in our own cars, you know, on the freeway, on our way towards the celestial city, we're making our way towards glory, towards heaven with one another, we can so often be like those who see up ahead our brother broken down on the side of the road, ensnared in some trespass or, or transgression, and what do we do? We just keep driving right past them, right? Eh, I can't be bothered. I don't have time for that kind of conversation right now. I don't, I'm, I don't like confrontation. I've never been a confrontational person. Someone else will help them, right? Let me, let me remind you of something very important. Um, God, it is God in his sovereignty who orchestrates the life of the church, right? I think we all agree with that, right? No, no one in a Reformed church wants to disagree. God is the one who orchestrates our life together in the church, and what that means is it is not an accident when God reveals something to you about a particular situation with your brother or your sister. If in God's providence he has revealed a brother's transgression to you, it means that God is entrusting you to be their keeper in that situation. Right? Not the six people that you'd like to gossip to about it. Right? He's entrusted it to you. And I don't know why God chooses to real, reveal certain situations to certain people and not to others, but I know that he does, and he does it on purpose. And that means that this is God's appointed task for you. Why? Well, it serves both parties. First of all, it's for your sanctification, right? To walk in the Spirit, to love them, to grow in compassion for sinners, to, to get over perhaps your fear of man, but also... It's God's way of working for the sinner's own good and preservation, right? Um, uh, this, is, this is for those of you who fear confrontation. Let me encourage you. The only way you get better at doing something is by doing it. I mean, I know it's not something that we all necessarily love to do, but it is loving to do, biblically speaking. And if we just pass the buck all the time and kick the can down the road to someone else, when will we ever get around to restoring our brother and obeying this command. That's the first thing about this word restore. It's a command, it's an imperative. The second thing is that this word restore emphasizes the goal of Christian correction. And this, is, this is vital. It, it's actually a very vivid word. Um, I, I'm not usually a big fan of word studies because they can be dangerous and misleading, but it is very fascinating the way that this, this word is used. It's used outside the Bible um, to refer to uh, setting a bone back in joint. So if, if your you know, shoulder becomes dislocated, someone who spoke Greek would use this word to speak of putting it back together, right? Popping it back into joint. It's also used in the New Testament of the disciples when they were mending their nets, right? It's the word for mending. And that kind of, those pictures give us an idea of what Paul's getting at. It carries the idea that my chief concern when my brother has trespassed is not myself, but rather, my chief concern is setting something right that's gone wrong in my brother in order to restore him to usefulness. Right? That's the goal of restoration. We, we want our brother to be useful. Uh, we want him to be a healthy Christian. We want him running the race with joy and assurance and a good conscience. Uh, we want God to be glorified. Uh, in other words, we care for the one who's ensnared, right? Uh, and we want to see him freed. Now, 
Going back to my comments from, from the beginning, this is a really good way and a really good place, and I'm preaching to myself here, to test whether you are walking in the Spirit and applying the Gospel in your correction or whether you are doing it in the flesh. The one walking in the Spirit desires the good of the sinner, while the one walking in the flesh always has selfish motives for correction. Um, and usually that motive is either vengeance, right? We want to punish them, or it is pride, right? We want to either punish the wrongdoer, or maybe both, we want to exalt our, ourselves by gloating over them and thinking how holy we are. I mean, I, I, I know and trust I'm not alone in this. Um, it is so easy for us to become legal in our hearts in the way we view the falls of our brother. Um, I think about my own heart, my own thoughts. Um, I think it was Spurgeon who said that, you know, when a man speaks evil of you, don't worry about it because he doesn't know the half of it. Uh, that there's a real sense in which I'm thankful you don't know my heart like God does. Um, I think about my own conversations and how tasty it is to the flesh to gloat and look down on the sins of others while doing nothing about it. Uh, I mean, we even replay over and over in our minds the sins that others have done. Why? Because it makes us feel good, right? Um, it, it makes us feel justified, and I would never do that. It makes us feel like the righteous one. That's a legal spirit, a spirit of legalism. Um, it's, it's a heart that has at least temporarily forgotten that it is sheer grace that causes me to differ from my brother. Um, if we correct our brother with that heart, we are going to devour him, as the Galatians were doing. We're not going to restore him. Right? Think, think about um, Jesus' parable of the uh, Pharisee and the tax collector, right? Luke 18. Um, two very different men in the temple. On the one hand, you've got the legalistic Pharisee, right? Luke tells us that he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous, right? They're legalists, they're Pharisees. You've got the legalistic Pharisee who's, what's he doing? I mean, he's standing in, in the open air and he is airing all of his supposed virtues, right? Um, you know, I tithe, I, I pray, I fast. But what does he also do? He gloats over the sins of others, right? Um, he even thanks God, I thank you that I am not like other men. I'm not an extortioner, I'm not an adulterer, or even like this tax collector. And then you've got the tax collector. What's he doing? He's contrite, standing afar off, right? And he's beating his breast, crying out what? God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Now, let me ask you honestly, which one of those two men would you prefer to be the one who corrects you? Uh, which one do you think is really going to love you and care for you? and have pity and compassion and restore you with a gospel heart and a gospel spirit. It's obvious, right? You're going to get smashed if the Pharisee comes in. <laughs> uh, but you're going to get humble, helpful restoration. Because those who have been forgiven much, those who are full of the gospel and know the debt that they owe to Christ for his love to us, they are the ones who can lovingly restore his erring brother. Now. Moving on, the next thing, and it's related to that, is Paul commands us, he says, do it in a spirit of gentleness or meekness. So this is the manner, the method of how we go about this. Now, let me clarify something right from the start. We, we live in such a sensitive generation. Um, I mean, we're being offended by Dr. Seuss books now, right? Um, gentleness doesn't mean being a sissy. And like, like you, you, you shouldn't dare talk frankly or clearly. And if you do, you're a mean person, right? There are, there are really are some people who think that. Uh, they think that correction by itself, I mean, you could do it with the biggest smile in the world on your face and the most tender of tone, and they would think that's mean because you just don't do that, right? You just let me be me, let me, you know, do me. Um, Christians shouldn't think that way. We, we are correcting a brother who's in sin, right? And so we have to be able to speak frankly about it, right? I mean, Paul, Jesus, when he talks about this, Matthew 18, it presupposes conversation. Jesus says, tell him his fault, right? That requires clear communication. Otherwise, how is he going to be restored? Right? I mean, that, that's like saying, I'm going to set this bone back in its joint without touching it. It's just not possible. You have to speak about sin and their offense and what restoration looks like. And... 
sometimes, this is just a side note on that point, sometimes I think we make these conversations a lot more painful and agonizing than they need to be for the, the one who is ensnared in sin simply because we don't have the courage to just cut to the chase and, and talk straight with them about what's going on. And uh, I, I mean, I, I personally appreciate it when someone brings correction, you know, not with an, an hour long preface, but just brief to the point, they pray with me and they, they commit me to God. But, okay, having said that, so we need to speak the truth to one another, we need to be faithful. Even say, having said that, though straight talk does need to happen, there is a way to be gentle about it. And, and the word here is meekness. I mean, there's, you almost have to give several English words to give the full orbed picture of what this word was getting at. Humility, uh, gentleness, all of those kind of get at what, what Paul's getting at here. But um, let, let me just give you three, just brief. There's a, a bunch of things I wanted to say on what gentleness looks like in correction, but I want to just give you a start. First of all, it should be evident that the correction comes from a heart of care and concern. I mean, that's vitally important. Um, there should not be an aroma of condemnation and superiority, but rather one of redemption. I mean, just like when we discipline our kids, right? Um, at least I hope when we discipline our kids, we affirm our love for them, right? We should tell our kids, I, I discipline you because I love you, right? Daddy disciplines you because we care for you. We care about the way you're going. We want you to go in the way that is glorifying to God and good for, for you. So that's the first thing. It should be evident that there is a heart that cares for them and concern for them. Um, also, secondly, even in the way that we talk with our, with our brother, it really should be brother to brother, right? Fellow soldier to fellow soldier not like a superior to, to an inferior. And I think you, you know what I'm getting at when I, when I say that. Um, you remember even Paul when he entreats uh, Philemon regarding Onesimus, and he basically says, uh, you know, uh, Philemon, though I have the authority to command you, what did he choose to do? He said, but instead I entreat you as a brother, right? Um, we, we don't want to be condescending and talk down to them and belittle them. them. Um, that, that reveals a heart of pride, if that's, if that's our goal. And this is just a, another side note, kind of application of that. This is where the teaching element of correction really needs to be done with a right heart. And we, we need to examine our hearts in this realm. Make no mistake, there needs to be instruction, right, when we're correcting someone. Um, there needs to be teaching. But... I've personally been on the receiving end of correction where it's obvious the person's pride is just being fed by the fact that they are in the place of being my teacher right now. Right? They're not teaching me to be helpful because I actually don't know it or you know, need to learn something. It's just uh, because their, their pride is swelling and it's feeding off of it. And you know, by the time they're done with their fifth sermon to you, it, it, it feels like you've been in purgatory, right? Um, and uh, you know, you're held hostage. That's not meekness. That's not a meek attitude. We should teach them, but only insofar as it's necessary and helpful. If they need to know what repentance looks like, we talk about those things. And again, we gently correct, we commit them to God. A third part of gentleness is, and this is vital, um, humility, meekness. A third part is that from one sinner to another in correction, you are holding out to them the hope of the gospel. Don't ever hide Christ from your erring brother. Uh, this is the time, perhaps more than ever, when your brother needs to hear the good news of Christ dying and rising again for sinners. Point him to the promises of God. Point him to how you yourself are a sinner. Point him to how God is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness when we confess our sins. So he exhorts us in this, to do this in a humble way, a meek way, a gentle way. And then he gives a warning. He says, he says, uh, Keep watch over yourself, right? He says, considering yourself or looking to yourself, lest you uh, always be, or lest you also be tempted. Now, what's that? What's that in there for? I think that's another pride check for us who would be restorers. No restorer ever ought to think himself beyond the, the ability to fall himself. Uh, whether it be falling into the same sins as our brother who is ensnared, or whether it be falling into pride and other sins, we are always to be those who have an eye on our own hearts as we seek to restore our brother. Um, 
just as it's Jesus instructs us, right, that we are dealing with our own heart. We're taking the log out of our own eye before we are addressing the speck in our brother's eye. And, and again, those, those words of the Apostle Paul should stand in our minds as an ever-present warning. Let him who thinks he stands, what? Take heed lest he fall. Pride comes before a fall. Uh, sin and the devil are deceitful and they will not spare us their temptation even in the midst of us trying to correct sin in a brother. That brings us to verse 2. Uh, just, just briefly here. He says, Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now some see, as I mentioned, these commands are, they come in very staccato format, very just one after another. Some see this as a, a, an isolated command that Paul is kind of entering into a new area here. I tend to see it as intimately connected with everything we've just considered. That loving, lovingly looking after our brother is how we help them bear the burden and thus we fulfill the law of Christ towards our brother. Um, and there's, there's irony here. We've seen it before. Paul speaks with much irony throughout this epistle. He's basically saying, you Galatians who have shown such great zeal in submitting yourself to the burden of the Mosaic law have neglected the very heart of what the law is all about. Right? What is, what is the summation of the law according to Jesus? Loving God with what? All of our mind, soul, uh, heart, mind, strength, and soul, and loving our neighbor as our self. In other words, Paul's saying to these guys, Galatians, here you are, you're straining out the gnats of circumcision and feast days and, you know, Sabbaths and whatever, thinking that you're pleasing God by doing those things. And meanwhile, while you're straining out those gnats, you're swallowing the camels of devouring those for whom Christ died. Right? You're not even keeping the law. You think you're keeping the law, and yet you're denying its most fundamental point, that it is love to neighbor. Um, you're, you're provoking one another and envying one another when you should be helping each other. Uh, and it's because you've departed from grace, at least they're being tempted to, and they have turned to the law. They're, they're trying to obey and please God without Christ, without the gospel. But Paul's whole point is it's only by looking to Christ it's only by the spirit which Christ gives to those who trust in him that we can even begin to actually love our neighbor and thereby fulfill the law. Right? The gospel brings the spirit, not the law. Um, and he's saying in a loving pastoral tone, but with some sarcasm, you guys, you Galatians, you need to drink deeply again from that fountain that is filled with blood where the son of God laid down his life for his friends. You need to drink again from that fountain which tells us of the one who bore our burdens, far worse burdens than we'll ever have to bear from our brother. He bore the burden of our sin. He bore the burden of the wrath of God in my place, the, the burden of being accursed by the Father and cut off so that we would now live free as free men and that we would now live by him and to him. And brothers and sisters of Bethany, I say to my shame, and I'm sure you would join me, I so often find myself complaining about the burdens the Lord gives us to care for and to carry with our brothers and sisters in the church. And we convince ourselves that the burden of loving our brother is just too heavy for me. It requires too much of us. And I think Paul would say to us, how about the burden of sin Christ carried up Calvary's mountain that had your name on it? How about the sight of him who made the world allowing himself to be stretched out on a tree of judgment in order to make you his and to drain God's wrath against you. I mean, how stingy we are when it comes to compassion and love and care for those for whom Christ died. How quickly we throw in the towel. Or, or the other side of pride and self-focus is how impressed we are sometimes with our puny efforts of love. <laughs> uh, our best efforts of love need to be repented of and they, they, they're nothing compared to what Christ has done for his people. Um, we sang in our, in our last hymn uh, this morning, we sang what the true response of our hearts should always be when we survey the wondrous cross. What was one of those lines? I pour contempt on what? All my pride. Right? We sung, were the whole realm of nature mine. That were a present far too small. But instead, 
Love so amazing, so divine demands what? My soul, my life, my all. My prayer for us as a congregation is that the glory of the cross would flood our souls when we're tempted to think of ourselves instead of bearing the burdens of our brothers. When we want to start focusing on my rights, do we dare speak of rights in the presence of Christ? Who is sinless, who deserved glory, who didn't deserve to weep or grieve or die, and yet he came for that very purpose to save a wretch like me. And not only me, but all of his church, that dear brother or that dear sister. How we need to remind ourselves of that in the midst of our complaining, in the midst of our pride. This is one for whom Christ died. He or she will be, by the grace of God, standing next to me at the judgment, one day made pure and spotless and blameless. And shall I now grow weary in loving him or her for whom Christ has loved so dearly? Now that brings us to our application section, just briefly in close. I have three applications, and most of them are summaries of what we've already seen, but I really want us to, as a church, be exhorted by what this requires of us and how we ought to respond to the word. Three, three brief applications, and they, uh, they all involve, uh, or the first two involve things that we need to put off, and then the second one has to do with something that we need to give God thanks for. Or the third one, excuse me. The first application is this. Put off indifference. I should say, put off the sin of indifference. And, and what I mean by that is indifference to your brother. Uh, we so often underestimate just how wicked and sinful sin is. Sin is the greatest enemy anyone on this planet has. It seeks to destroy us. And it will lead countless to eternal judgment. Um, sin is deceitful, right? It's not only dangerous, it is deceitful, right? Writer to the Hebrews. Which is why we need what? We need the church. We need brothers and sisters who keep us in the path. Keep us walking on the path of righteousness. And this is what I want to exhort us in. It is one of the most unloving things we can do to simply turn a blind eye to our brother's sin and our brother's trespasses. Uh, to just not care that he's ensnared and entangled, to, to be selfish, right? And focused on myself because I don't like confrontation and things like that, um, to just let him continue going on the way that he's going. That's not love. Uh, Puritan Thomas Goodwin said, he said, when we sin against Christ, Christ's heart is more moved to pity than it is to anger. And then he went on and he said, Christ tends, tends to us as his brothers like a father pities his child who is afflicted by some loathsome disease. The father doesn't hate his child. He hates the disease and tends to his needs. And brothers and sisters, we are called to emulate Christ's heart toward one another. Um, we, when we discover our brother ensnared in trespass or sin, whether it be pride or gossip or impurity, our hearts ought to be moved more towards pity for our brother to help him than it is towards anger. And it should drive us like physicians to seek to, with all the, all the resources that we have, to seek to put back into joint for our brother what has been broken, that our brother might again be useful and uh, helpful. So that's the first thing, is put off the sin of indifference. The second thing is put off arrogance. Put off arrogance. Meekness, as we've already seen, should govern our relationships together. And I think it's obvious to all of you by now, I don't even have to say this, but I will just to be very clear. It's obvious, I'm not advocating here, uh, you know, that we all just suddenly become sin sniffers and heresy hunters, right? And that all of a sudden we just turn and start devouring one another over every, every little thing. Um, again, that would be pride, right? Um, but how do we cultivate redemptive restoration? And that that would be the, um, the um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not vibe, but anyway, you know what I'm saying, of our congregation. How do we develop... Uh, and cultivate redemptive restoration as opposed to conceited, legalistic provoking of one another? And the answer to that is pretty simple. It's what the Apostle Paul has done this entire epistle. It's us more and more being rooted in the gospel of grace. 
And if that sounds simplistic to you this morning, perhaps it's because your view of the power of the gospel has been eclipsed. Uh, The most important task, the most important work every day that the Christian is to give himself to is to remind ourselves of the gospel. And if we genuinely did that, we would not be arrogant towards our brother. If we are reminding ourselves of what a wretch I am by nature and believing that, right? Not just saying it, but believing in in my heart of hearts that if the hand of God were to be removed from me, I am such a wretch in and of myself, I am capable of all the same sins of my brother and far worse ones. And yet, we move from there to the glorious good news of the Gospel, and yet Christ Jesus came into the world not to be served, but to serve me and to restore me. He came to bear my condemnation, not pour out His condemnation on me. And he's put his spirit within me to make me like himself, right? We're being conformed into the image of Christ so that I now share in the joy of holiness and I become a restorer. Like Christ is a restorer of his church, I rejoice in my brother, seeing him walk in the truth as well. And so, if we're rooted there, believing the gospel, loving the gospel, in communion with Christ, What happens when I stumble across my brother sinking in a pit of quicksand, of sin? Well, what I don't do is I don't throw a 500-pound burden of him on him of conceit and arrogance and condemnation, but rather I plant my feet on firm gospel soil and I pull him out with me. I give him grace as he, as I have received grace. I bind up his wounds and restore him to usefulness because that's exactly what God in Christ has done for me. That brings us to the third and last thing. Be thankful for faithful brothers and sisters in the church. Be thankful. I wanted to end on this note. Uh, I've directed most of this sermon uh, to, uh, to us when we are the ones doing the restoring, but I want to close by exhorting us for when we are the ones who are being restored. Um, when that's our turn, we're the one who's been ensnared in a trespass, and a brother comes along and restores us, I want to encourage us, give thanks to God when someone does Galatians 6 to you. Uh, I, I know, such is the nature of our pride, that seldom do we receive correction without bristling a bit. I, I get that. I'm a man of you know, like nature, just like you. Um, but there is almost no greater asset in this world than a friend who points us to Christ, who cares about us enough spiritually to speak the truth to us, Uh, who love us for Christ's sake and desire to see Christ formed in us. I want to encourage us, don't resist such a brother or such a sister. Um, In the care of our brother, we perceive the care of God. Um, That God, through this brother, is proving His promise that He doesn't leave me or forsake me. Um, That God exposes our trespasses to others is an instrument of our healing and God preserving us and mending us. Pastors need this. That's why it's it's God's wisdom for the church to have a plurality of elders. Um, I hope you know John and Gary and myself, we correct each other, we challenge one another. Um, But not just pastors, all of us need this. And when you have it in a church, it's something to rejoice in, not despise. Uh, You don't want, trust me, legalists biting and devouring you. You want grace-filled, spirit-led Christians who desire your good and the glory of God. And so, brothers, sisters, as we close, let us also clothe ourselves in humility, not only in our restoring, but in our receiving restoration and receiving the gracious staff and rod of God through brothers and sisters who care for us. Our time is gone. Let Let us pray together. Father, we pray you would write your word upon our hearts. Lord, we pray that your spirit would instruct our minds, but also empower our hearts, that we would be more loving, that the fruit of the spirit would more and more be shown in our lives, that our lives truly would be like a tree uh, planted uh, beside streams of water, that stream being your blessed spirit who is constantly nourishing us with Christ, Father, we pray that we would, as your people, put off arrogance, that we would put off conceit and provoking one another, 
Lord, that we would put off the remaining legalism that still resides at times in every Christian's heart. Lord, you are restoring your people. We, we've believed your gospel by your grace that it is only by Christ that we are reconciled to you and to one another. We pray that you'd help us to walk more in that. Father, we thank you for your patience with your children. We thank you for your caring, your caring staff and rod by which you guide us, that you've given us the, the body of Christ in the local church, that we might be each other's keepers, that we might look after our brothers, our sisters, Father, we pray that more and more you would make Bethany a church that is growing in this kind of redemptive restoration. Lord, let us, let us put aside fear of man. We pray that you would help us to get over our own selfishness of simply not wanting to have tough uh, discussions. But Lord, we would remember the dangers of sin, the, the, deceit, the deceitfulness of sin, that we would love our brother more than we love ourselves. Lord, we pray that you draw near to us as we come to the Lord's table. Lord, may we reflect on your goodness to us in giving your Son, your Son willingly coming into this world, very God of very God, becoming man, that he might serve us and lay down his life in our stead and rise again on the third day and ascend into glory to bring us where he is. Father, we pray that our assurance would be strengthened that you would teach us, Lord, more and more to live by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. Help us, Lord, we pray. Draw near to your people. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.